Good evening, everybody. Welcome to tonight's Top Talk guest webinar session. Uh, hi, Ross. I know you're sat in the wings because I'm waving at you. How you doing? We've got Ross actually in uh, in the studios with us today, so he's been down filming with us. So it's nice actually having uh, having Ross with me, and I can tell I can't, you couldn't get away, to be honest. So good evening, Ross. How you doing? Hi, Jay. How are you? I'm um, excellent, mate. So as I said, we've had everybody. You've been with us filming all day today, looking at 4K photography. Um, and another day of filming tomorrow. Uh, before I quickly get going, Russ, just tell them a little bit about yourself. I know it's part of your presentation, but how you kind of got into photography, a little bit of your background, and uh, how you got to the 4K pioneer. Well, the way I actually got in photography was when I was at school. I was completely fascinated on how that image ended up on a piece of paper. So I had to learn. So I actually joined a photography club at school, and that's my basis on getting in photography. Uh, the journey which took me into 4K photography sort of started about two years ago when I met a guy called Mark Baber from Panasonic, one of the image specialists there, um, and he put a, a camera in my hand, but I'll go into that in more depth soon, but um, that's sort of how I got into 4K photography and I'm just completely uh, immersed in it. I was very slow moving from film to digital, so when this opportunity came along I felt I had to sort of jump and get ahead of the game because I could see the, the potential of it, so I uh, sort of jumped in the deep end and, and, and started swimming, so to speak, and um, it's, it's been a, a steep learning curve, but very rewarding learning curve as well. Well, we've had a lot of fun. Well, I say we've had a lot of fun. Uh, Sam and Steve have been filming with you today, and uh, I think they've uh, had their eyes opened. As, and, and as have I uh, chatting to you in the background about that, sort of how things are changing within photography, and the whole realm of 4K photography is really, really interesting to me and exciting. So great to have you with us and share that. So, Ross, we're not going to waste any time, bud. I'm going to hand you the screen and let you know when we can uh, see it as the audience and uh, we can get started and you can tell everybody about 4K photography. Brilliant, thanks Jay. Hi everyone, um, it's 4K photography. It's uh, something I'm extremely passionate about. Um, someone actually uh, said to me at SWPP, oh, Ross Street, this 4K pioneer, and I was sort of taken back a bit. I said, you shoot quite a lot of this. I said, well, I've been shooting it for about two years, sort of immersed myself into it, and, and the results are quite quite amazing. It's it's a sort of technology you can use not just in, in sport or anything like that, stills. I'm going to sort of take you on a bit of a journey that you've gone through. I'll tell you a little bit about myself first. Um, I am a New Zealander. I'm not Australian or anything like that. Uh, we did the win World Cup twice. Oh, three times, sorry. Three times. I can't, can't get 1987. Uh, I am part Welsh. And I am part Scottish, so uh, I'm a bit of everything chucked in there. But uh, my, my life in photography started at high school, and my first job in photography was uh, for a company called AJ Hackett Bungie in New Zealand, so I was uh, photographing people jumping off bridges. So, And this is in the days of film, everything had to be very quick, very on the mark. So, um, And that's the way I work. I work very, very fast with working with the guys today. Um, 4K is ideal for me because it's a very fast technology, and I'm going to explain later on what exactly 4K photography is. Um, so I started this journey with, with like I said, with Mark Baber uh, from Panasonic, and at the time I was using DSLRs, and he put a GX7 into my hand. Uh, GX7 is uh, one of this uh, mid-range sort of uh, Lumix cameras that's been superseded by the GX8 now. Um, and he said, what do you think? And I thought, it's quite a cool camera. And I'm very much the person, whatever camera you buy, you, you should bond with that camera. Whatever make it is, you should bond with it. Because it's a very personal thing. You're going to spend a lot of time with that. So when you pick up a camera and you like it, then that's a good start. Anyway, I like the feel of this, and I took it away with me, and uh, I had great results. Now, this camera didn't uh, do 4K at the time, but the next camera that was put in my hand was a GH4, and that did 4K. And that's when I started shooting things like the photo you can see in front of you. This is shot in Dublin through a pub window when it was raining on 4K. So the, the beauty about 4K is it's unintrusive, there's no shutter, so it's perfect for street photography. So those things, we're going to talk about that more as well. Um, but what do I do? I've got a portrait studio in Cresselli. Uh, I do portraits and commercial work. I tend to travel the world as well uh, with my portraiture, and, and that's how I make a living. I'm a photographer uh, full time and have been for over 20 years. I love it. I love everything I, I do and I'm forever learning. The day you stop learning in photography, I think, is the day you hang up your camera. Um, I'm not one of those persons who thinks I know everything. I love spending time with my peers and, and learning off them. 
So what do I carry in my bag when I go out and about? So I carry around an urban think tank pro, uh, urban approach, sorry, and in that bag, it's a bit of a TARDIS really, I can fit all of this, the GH4, a GX8, beautiful Noctichron 1.2, the new 100 to 400 F4, 15 mil, 12 to 35, which is equivalent to 24 to, to 70, 25 mil and a MacBook Pro as well. So I tend to cram a lot in a little bag um, and it's great because I travel abroad to do shoots as well and um, when I'm going to uh, New Zealand um, I can take that little bag instead of my DSLR kit when I did last time and these are, these are actually uh, photos I took with the GX7 when I went out to New Zealand. These are very personal photos to me, just a family trip. Uh, it's a lot of nostalgia there for me as well and friends. Um, and it's because I had a very light camera and all I had was a GX7 with a pancake lens which is like a 20mm lens and that's all I used the whole time I was out there. Um, I took my DSLR kit out there, I didn't get it out of the bag once, much to my wife's uh, <laughs> disgust. Uh, so yeah, I, I was lugging this around the whole time and I had a little GX7 slung over my shoulder and I had a lot of, a lot of fun with it. But we're entering a, a new era in photography now. Uh, there's been a debate you know, what's going to happen, there's always going to be DSLR, there's always going to be mirrorless, there's always going to be options. As, as photographers, we've got the luxury where we can choose. You know, I call the, the big four now, your Lumix, Sony, Fuji, um, and Olympus. There's such a variety in the mirrorless market now, and then of course you've got your DSLR cameras if you choose to use those. I institute mirrorless, uh, DSLR for 20 years. But then this landed on my plate and I thought, as a business, this is fantastic. So when the GX8 came out, I had a little bit of fun. Star Wars was out. Everyone likes a bit of Star Wars. Every bloke does. Um, and this is what we're going to go through tonight. We've done my introduction. 4K photography, I'm going to take you through that. I'm also going to take you through why I did the change. I'm going to explain to you also how good is mirrorless and how good is 4K and most importantly, how to get a still from 4K. That question you're asking yourself, do I still need my DSLR? And can I use mirrorless in my business? I'll put this to mind now, I'm a full-time photographer and I'm using mirrorless in my business. And clients' perceptions, what do clients think when you rock up with a small camera? That's a question I get asked a lot, I'm going to ask that one for you as well. And the fuss all about 4K photos. So 4K photography. Some people think it's cheating, but you still need the same skills as a photographer. You still have to compose that photo, you still have to think about uh, your shutter speed, your ISO, your aperture, all those that skill set that a photographer uses for every photo he takes, he or her takes. Um, so after you've been doing it for so long, it's quite intuitive, and this it's the same principles that you apply. This is a photo of my son Morgan. This is one of the first 4K photos I took. It was on a GH4, and I was just out there, not reading the manual as any bloke tends to do. I just wanted to get there and play with the camera and push the boundaries and see what it does. And I was really pleased with the results. And because I shoot in 4K, one of the main reasons is because it's high shutter speed. With 4K photography, you can exploit the high shutter speed because it's a video format. So this is shot at 30 frames a second. Now our normal DSLRs, they shoot at around, say, 10, 12 frames a second on the high end. Um, but the uh, GH4, the G7 uh, is 25 frames a second. The GH4 is 30 frames a second. GX8. Um, 25 frames a second. Again, these are Lumix cameras I'm referring to, uh, but they are all capable of, of doing 4K photography. The other thing about 4K photography is it's incredibly discreet. So if you're into your street photography, um, or you've got someone who doesn't like having the photo taken, but they desperately want a nice photo, or they blink a lot, there's it's another tool in your camera bag that you can use. Quick to market, I refer to that, and I'm going to talk about that a bit later as well. Is you, with using uh, these cameras, they all have built-in Wi-Fi as well, so you can turn around and get something incredibly quick to the market through the use of an image app and have it online on Twitter. I use Twitter quite a lot, uh, and for me, getting images quick to market when I'm out in the middle of nowhere is very good and very, very useful for a business. 
and it's usable across all the platforms as well. So if you're a sports photographer, portrait, food photographer, it's endless the genres of photography we've got. It can apply to everything. So it's not just for catching action, and I'll explain that later on as well. So you, like I said, you need the same mindset as a photographer when uh, actually shooting 4K to, to get the best out of it. You're not going to be taken over by a, a horde of videographers roaming the world taking all these photos. Videographers work very, very different uh, to a photographer. A photographer is going to go out there and uh, exploit that frame rate, whereas a videographer may just grab a photo, but he'll be using a completely different frame rate. Also with 4K photography, you're thinking, oh, I'm not sure about this, I won't be able to get very big prints. With 4K, you can get an 8.3 meg file. From that 8.3 meg file, I have had a 38 inch print. I've got that print on my wall in the studio. And with talking to uh, Adobe uh, recently, uh, Richard Curtis at Adobe, he's told me that we could even go bigger. Um, and that's just using basic tools like uh, Photoshop, or very powerful tools, like Photoshop, um, to enlarge the prints. And I'll, again, I'll show you how they do that uh, in this talk. And it's so simple. I'm, I like getting out and taking photos. I'm not the sort of person who likes to sit behind my desk all day and retouch. I tend to go out, get a writing camera, so I can have time with my family, have a lot of fun, and also photography should be fun. So I'm going to teach you, hopefully, some new tools. Um, I'm sure you'll have some good questions coming up as well, and uh, we'll, we'll move from there. So the two mindsets of, of uh, users of 4K photography. Now this is a photo of Emily Sandy, uh, shot in 4K. The first mindset is a photographer. That person is going to be there, and they're going to be shooting 15, 20 second bursts and pulling that still so they can print that, send them off to press, whatever they want to do. The second one is going to be a videographer. Now, your videographer is going to be filming at a much slower, much slower uh, shutter speed because they want a beautiful, smooth video. So maybe around 50, 50th of a second, a videographer may be shooting at, where a photographer uh, will be shooting at a lot higher. So if a videographer pulls a still from their footage, that's more likely to be blurred. Uh, but if you watch it in normal video, it's not going to seem that way. So the question you guys are all sitting there, scratching your grey matter, are thinking, what is 4K? Simple, 4K is four times the res uh, resolution of HD. So we've got HD monitors, we've got HD tellies in our house. Imagine that telly and four times the resolution of that. The tellies are out there now as well. That's what 4K is. So if you pulled a frame from your um, camera which shoots in HD, you would get a 2 megapixel file or a 2 megapixel JPEG. If you shoot in 4K, you're getting four times that, so you can 8.3 megapixel uh, JPEG. It's also higher than broadcast quality. Um, there was a famous uh, session at Sky News a few years ago with the uh, students in Chechnya. And I think it was over the, the Rebels or something, uh, attacked some journalists. They went for his big camera threw it on the ground, trashed it. The, the uh, cameraman actually had a GH4 in his hand and he continued filming on 4K and they weren't interested in that camera because they didn't think it had any value because it was small. And uh, that went viral, I believe it's on YouTube somewhere, and that created a lot of interest. And because it was 4K, it was broadcast, uh, broadcast quality, the footage is amazing. So these little cameras are great. And for all these Star Wars fans out there, if you've ever watched uh, Star Wars and the drone footage on Star Wars, that was all filmed on little GH4s to get the 4K footage out of that. Ultimately, it is a high-res video format, but as photographers, like myself, I'm exploiting that high frame rate. I want to be able to take frame grabs using that high frame rate, and that's the key phrase, frame grabs. We're not doing screen grabs. Screen grab is your whole screen and the pixels on that screen. We are literally grabbing a frame, so if, if you imagine old school, a strip of negatives, and we'll grab a frame from that, and that's what we're doing. You can do this in camera as well. You can grab your frame in camera, or you can use such tools as Lightroom, uh, which is uh, which I've done a bit of a film with the guys uh, earlier, which I'm sure we uh, 
out soon. <laughs> okay, when you're shooting in 4K, and this is really, really important to get the foot uh, to get the correct footage. It's you need a fast card. Just your good old pound shop SD card isn't going to do the magic for you. Um, the reason is because there's a lot of informa information when you're shooting 4K. And to give you an idea, for every minute you shoot in 4K is equivalent to one gig on that card. So if it's 64 gig card, roughly 64 minutes. So roughly an hour on a 64 gig card. I shoot in 10 to 15 second bursts, so a card can last me quite a long time. But you need a U3 card, uh, so you want the card is actually faster uh, than the uh, camera itself. So as you're sitting back in your, your chair tonight and you've got a glass of wine in your hand and you're thinking, why would I use 4K? I'm a photographer. Because it's simple. You might miss moments like this. Your kids with their mates are out having a bit of summer fun. I don't know what they are. Oh, mind you, I did see that blue, bright thing in the sky today. I got a bit of a shock when I was driving up. <laughs> and these, these are simple moments which I couldn't capture using this a stills camera um, because I was able to go through the sequence and choose the actual frame I wanted. Now again, I could print this really up to 38 inches if I wanted. Um, I've got that luxury in the bag. Again, you're thinking, yeah, but that was just kids jumping off. What about this? It's my daughter throwing a bucket of water over her older son Morgan. Um, I wouldn't be able to pick that exact moment when the water is just about to impact on his head if I wasn't shooting in 4K at 30 frames a second. And when you shoot things like this, it opens opportunities as well. As a professional photographer, and it's a lot of fun as well as uh, an amateur or as an enthusiast, but as a professional photographer, we're out there obviously to make a living. So from this, when I'm shooting this style, I can go straight to something like this. So that's what it creates. This went all the way across Europe, the US, and picked up on it, which I was very pleased about. And they used it in Vegas, which the kids were delighted to say they've been to Vegas. And very few of you now, this is the winter edition. Not many people have seen this at all. So uh, I think only a few people at Panasonic may have seen this, but this is the winter edition. But going on from throwing buckets of water and th throwing snow at each other, it's about having fun. My daughter doing a cartwheel in the back field. And I've got the whole sequence I could stitch together uh, to, onto one photo if I wanted. But I, I love that photo. Legs in the air, having fun, carefree. And that's what it's about. And when I shoot, shot this particular sequence, I shot it using focus peaking. Now, if you're not familiar what focus peaking is, it's a it's a bit of video technology which used to be on the very cams, sort of high-end uh, video cameras. And what it does, when you use manual focus, it will allow you, it will highlight for you in a bright colour which areas are in focus. So rather than just having a clear screen and sort of guessing that's in focus manually, it will actually tell you which parts are in focus. So you can see behind my daughter there, it's the uh, depth is falling off, and in front I've got a quite nicely balanced. So I was able to use that and shoot in 4K so she was going to cartwheel across from left to right and that's the photo I got. I was really pleased with it. But it's not just action, what it's all about. Now this is a, play, this is a pot of Japanese food. One of my clients is the Water for Storia. And I was shooting some food for them uh, and I was shooting stills and I could not get the smoke right coming out uh, of the pot. So I flicked literally to 4K, it is that simple. I flicked over to 4K, filmed an 18 second clip, then reviewed it on the back of the camera with the uh, marketing director right beside me and they just said, that's the image. And I went, that's right. And so it's just that extra tool I had there was able to produce the goods that my client wanted and right in front of them as well. They loved that interaction as well, how it worked frame by frame. I could actually do that. By shooting 18 seconds, it's almost equivalent to 600 potential photos. But I got what my client wanted and I nailed it and that's the key thing for me. Again, it's not just about action. You can do amazing portraiture of your friends. 
because there is no shutter firing off, when you're sitting in a pub in Dublin doing some research, and your mate's sitting there gazing out the window at the liquid sunshine coming down, it's a, it's a great tool. So I took this photo of my mate and uh, showed it to him, and he hadn't even realised, because we were literally street watching people, it's a great place, Temple Bar for, for street photography and Guinness, <laughs> and, uh, and I showed it to him, and it's like, wow, fantastic. And I love those moments when people see their photos that they don't know have been taken. Um, taken into effect, you don't want to do it to people who seriously don't want their photo taken, but you know, the people who want their photo taken, and you know those people, um, do it that way. But heading on to that, it is perfect for street photography. The photo you saw at the start of the guy having a cigarette, and I quite like the irony of it, is the security cam at the bottom is looking straight back at me and he's uh, smoking beside the chemist sign. Um, there's a lot of little messages in there which I quite like. There's one I did in, in London, I was up in London last weekend with my family over half term, and we're on the tube, and my wife's sitting across from me, and this gentleman in front of me, facing me, quite thick set, but the most amazing face on him. And I wanted to take a photo, and my wife knew it, and she's sort of shaking her head, and I thought, do I do it in 4K? Because I knew there would be no shutter. So I thought, Sort of, I'll do it. Put the put the down on my a waist, 4K, and I had a great photo. I haven't put it up on here yet, but it is a great photo, and uh, I'm sure you'll see it when you follow me online. And this was all taken through a pub window. That's the key point. Sitting down and people watching. So on location as well is absolutely fantastic. Now for you videographers out there, you will know what vlog is. Uh, for, for a lot of photographers, I didn't know what vlog was. Vlog is a very flat video format, which again was only sort of available when the more Vericam uh, cameras, uh, more expensive Vericam cameras, and then uh, Panasonic introduced it into their GH4. And it gives the uh, the editor it increases dynamic range to 12, basically. So this is a very flat format. Then I've taken it into Lightroom. I've edited in Lightroom, so I've uh, put the colours I wanted in, I've maybe toned down some things, literally spent two minutes in Lightroom on it, and that's the result. This is a friend of mine, uh, Nick Quinn, he's a key instructor in France, and we had a lot of fun uh, shooting these out there in a pretty sort of bleak conditions. The sun wasn't out, but you can see the contrast that's punched back into that as well. So 4K is sort of taught me a lot about the industry, you know, vlog, how I can edit in Lightroom, I didn't realise I could do that when I just imported it into Lightroom and it was there, so a lot of the tools are already there, which we've already got at home anyway. So on location, this is actually taken on Sunday, uh, down in Broadhaven, near Church Rock in Pembrokeshire, uh, it's 4K, uh, these guys actually came out, a load of surfers came out, it's absolutely fantastic just watching them, and I was trying the new 100 to 400 lens, there's a bit of a story to this, there's a guy next to me on the beach with his DSLR, and he had like a 70 to 200 on it, and he kept looking at me, because, looking back at me, and eventually he sort of said, what are you using? And I showed him, and he was completely blown away, because um, I had a GX8 with a 100 to 400, and it's not a big bit of kit, but it's got, it's like a camera on steroids, if it's the best way to describe it, because it does a lot. Um, and I got this, uh, shooting 4K, uh, I think I might have had the tracking on as well, um, so I was I was pretty chuffed with that image. Um, I will send this on to the surfer as well, because a few of my mates know who he is. So in the studio as well, in a controlled environment, what is it like? This is my youngest son, Owen, he's, he's lit with two lime lights, uh, mosaics either side, so sandwich lit if you like, diving onto a mattress, <laughs> but he missed the mattress on this occasion and went flying off the other side. Um, I don't have um, high speed sync lights at all, so uh, this works ideal for me, um, and it's an, again, it's another option that I can use in the studio, which got me thinking, how far can I do? So product photography, this will make it interesting. So I was playing around with some strawberries and some cream, and again, lit just with the uh, limelight mosaics, so I don't have uh, the high speed sinks. And this, I believe, from memory, was about uh, 10 thousandths of a second I was shooting at in 4K. So 
the technology is there. It's so easy to use. It's a lot of. It's very intuitive how to use because you were using the principles that we use as photographers. When you're shooting, you can shoot fully manual. You can shoot if you want in full program. You can shoot an aperture priority or or uh, shutter priority. So you've got those those luxuries. Now last year, Ironman Wales came to Pembrokeshire again. This is Jesse Thomas. He won Ironman Wales last year in fine form as well. Jesse's using my image. He did ask for permission, which is always nice. Jesse's using my uh, 4K image on his social media. So this is his uh, Facebook page, and I'm actually running along the road. This is uh, in Cresselli near Creswell Quay for all those fine uh, pub drinkers of you out there. And I'm actually got this on a Ronin M running along the road. So a Ronin M is a, like a camera stabilizer. It's like a gimbal, so that's going to keep my camera uh, pretty much like a running tripod, probably the most accurate way of describing it. And running along the road, I'm actually sitting <laughs> in the office, moving my arm as if I'm running along the road here. Um, and I'm filming in 4K. So when he's gone flying past at 20 odd miles an hour, I can review that. And then I've edited that in Lightroom, posted it on social media. Jesse's come back to me and said, I love it. Can I use it? Yes, let's talk. And he's also said the same, can I use it on my Twitter as well? And I said, of course you can. Uh, and here's the original image. So doing little things like that and using social media, been having to get things up there very quickly is also very powerful for your business as well. And if you're very, you can actually make out just behind him, the race referee uh, is making sure he's doing everything right. So SWPP, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, I wanted to push the boundaries of 4K. Um, I wanted to see how big we could print it. And at the time, I was printing to A3 quite confidently. And we printed on site there to A3. So this is Alice who modeled for us at, at, uh, at the show. Um, but I wanted to go bigger. And I knew we could go bigger. But at the show, I shot this. And a lot of people had a lot of interest. It was quite a good talking point because it was quite new as well. And um, British Photography News picked up on it. And this became the second cover, second 4K cover that had ever been published. The first one was with amateur photography. Uh, certainly it wasn't mine, but uh, I got the second one. So I, I, I like pushing my cameras and, and the technology, what they do. I'm, I do make Panasonic nervous at times because I am pushing their technology, but I also surprise them with, with what I come up with. Um, and that makes them proud of their kit. And I, I'm proud of the cameras I use. Like I said, I bond with the cameras I use, and that's why I like them. I wouldn't be using those cameras if I didn't like them. So where do I go now? How do I use this? Well, I use this in everyday usage. So personal use for me is increased the photos I take of the family. This is my uh, by Morgan. He's wicket keeping. Um, it's a 4K image, and because the camera is small, it's very portable for me, so I'm not lugging around a, a big DSLR with a big lens in front of it and around all day and getting in front of people. I'm sitting there with a small camera with a quite a large zoom, and I can, I can video him as well and pull that grab, so it's a win-win for me. I can video his, his teammates as well. This is uh, Kerry Cricket Club. But with all that sort of 4K information flying around your head, take one second and think, what does one second of 4K look like? This is what one second looks like. So this is 30 frames, overlaid, overlaid, overlaid. This did take me a bit of time, I must add, but it was worth it because it's a fantastic example of what that one second is capturing. And again, I photographed my son, and it's a really good training tool as well for kids and stuff. So there's all this potential that you can see that is is out there of what 4K can do. GH4, 30 frames a second with a 15mm lens. The thing with mirrorless as well, you'll notice the lenses, uh, you actually double to the equivalent in uh, full frame rate. So if I'm talking 15mm in mirrorless, it's the equivalent to a 30mm in uh old school terms, if you like. Now, normally um, I'd show a bit of video because we're uh, on the internet and um, the hemp running too quickly, um, I can't really uh, pop up the 
uh, HD video. Um, but what it is, this is my mate Dave. <laughs> Dave loves being photographed, and I photograph. Well, I say photographed. Took 4K photos of him. It was a 18 18 second clip, uh, and he was waiting for the lights to go off. So I took grab. From that 18 second clip, I grabbed three photos which I liked because he started pulling faces, give me a bit of variety. I went, brilliant, thanks mate. And at the end, he said, are you going to take a photo? There's no flash. I said, no, we're done. It's 4K, there's no sound. I'm using modeling lights. And this, this photo is done with modeling lights, uh, which you can use. So if you're at home, if you are using lights at home and modeling lights, be aware you may get a bit of a flicker going on with your uh, lights, and that's because your shutter, shutter speed needs to synchronize with the frequency of the lights, and that is down around the 110, 110th of the second mark, so you may need to drop it down that if you are getting a flicker. Some cameras like the GH4 have synchro scan, so you can get very, very accurate with that. So from the photos I went through, which one do you think I went for? Which one do you think is a 38-inch canvas on my wall? Well, it only had to be one, really, didn't it? Of course, it's going to be that one. So people walk in, and of course, kids walk into, into my studio, and they see that on the wall. They have a right giggle. The fact that a lot of people think it's me is a bit worrying, but it's not. <laughs> so how do I get an 8.3 meg file up to a 38-inch print by using Photoshop? I'll show you. It's quite simply. When you're in Photoshop and you're enlarging your prints, go to image size. And when you go to image size, scroll down and you'll see preserve details enlargement. And that is the key. Make sure you have that clicked on. And because you can always print to the native size of, of what your camera is shooting, but this allows you to go beyond that. So this allows me to print up to such sizes on 4K at 38 inches, and I know I can go larger now, but with mirrorless stills, I've printed 60 inches, and I can go larger. I brought some in for the guys today, which we used during filming, and that sort of uh, blew them away. But for 4K, or any enlargements, you should try this in Photoshop. It's fantastic, and it's so easy to use. Again, the tools are right there. So, where are we going to go? Well, I truly believe where we are at the moment, mirrorless is the way to go um, because the technology is moving so ridiculously fast um, that it excites uh, me with just everything that comes out every minute. Everything you see and read uh, is mirrorless out there. There's some fantastic photographers out there. You've got Kevin Mullen shooting mirrorless um, uh, wedding photography. Um, to just one for example. Uh, you've got Damien Lovegrove again shooting realist. You've got guys like uh, Stephen Cleary, uh, Ian Cook, fantastic sports photographers as well. So some great people out there shooting uh, beautiful photos and shooting film on little cameras because they punch a lot. It's not always about having a big camera to get big results. So where to next? 6K, 8K, what's going to happen? Well, Panasonic announced in Photokina in 2014 that they aim to produce by 2020 8K and 6K. To give you an idea, 6K will give you an 18 million pixel frame grab. If we get 8K, you'll get a 33 million pixel frame grab. You can just see all the people manufacturing hard drives rubbing their hands, really. But uh, it's very exciting the way technology is going, and I'm quite excited about it. Uh, so there's a few. Uh, it, it's never going to stop. We're, we're, we're in that luxury now where uh, the manufacturers are making stuff which everyone's enjoying. So, you know, sit back and try things out. Don't be afraid to try things out. There's a little phrase I sort of go by as well. Is if we didn't blink, we'd see twice as much. It's a little thing I remind myself, and uh, it's always keep your eyes open. Don't get complacent about your surroundings as well, because when we the environments we live in as well is always good photographic environments. Whatever you shoot, whether you're shooting sports, portraits, weddings, whatever it may be, 
If you didn't blink, we'd see twice as much as more. Open your eyes and see some riders in front of you. And I came out with that. So thanks very much. We're going to go through some details. Um, I think you actually answered uh, this kind of first question as part of it, but let's recap on it anyway. Um, obviously, talking about uh, the video. So what's the, the what's the key with uh, with the focus? You talked about focus peaking. So should we just touch that on again? Touch over that again. Yeah. Ah, there we are. Hello, I'm back. <laughs> so focus peaking, you use it when you're focusing manually. And what you'll see on screen, um, you actually, the beauty, if I first explain, the beauty about mirrorless cameras, you actually get to see what the sensor is seeing. So when you're looking through your eyepiece or you're looking on the back of the screen, you'll actually be able to see that. So when you're focusing, uh, you'll see highlights come around the focus points. So it may be a bright green, maybe your focus peaking color. And that bright green will actually come quite bright and you'll know that's pin sharp and that's what focus peaking is so it allows you to focus manually very very accurately but it's video technology that photographers have now been able to use that videographers have had the luxury for for a few years uh, brilliant what's the what's the noise the noise like uh, with the with the images is it the same as a normal camera with the low lighting and so on or you know um, low lighting my sort of, uh, it came with me, well, the, the one with the cream actually earlier, uh, that was actually at 6400 ISO uh, with the cream and the, in the, what is it, strawberries, that's the fruit. <laughs> uh, that was shot at 6400 ISO, so it's, it's pretty good. Uh, the, the ISO on stills is, uh, the noise is actually less when shooting stills. That's just a, a fact between photos and video. Um, again, that technology is always going to improve. Uh, I'm quite comfortable with the technology at the moment, and for 4K photos, um, I'm quite happy with the noise myself. There's, there's limited. If you, if it's too much noise, make it black and white. I like grey myself. Again, it, it's you know, it's it's one of those personal choice things. Like the surf photo I, I shot earlier, um, I shot that it's uh, 1,200 of a second. So I cranked the ISO up to, I think, about 3,200 because I wanted actually some noise in it because I wanted that gritty look with the sea and everything like that. So it depends what you're actually sort of uh, showing as well. Uh, but I tend to sort of light, like a bit of a, a gritty look to it. Uh, brilliant. Um, I know you did touch on... Uh just jump to the wrong section, jump back to the first question. Uh, you touched on this and you explained uh, the different ways that you can shoot 4K, but uh, somebody's asked if we could just recap it. So the settings on the camera, you can pretty much use that, any of them? Yeah, well, a couple of the cameras, if you're uh, using, if you, if you go into manual mode, if you go into your video mode, there'll be a little dial on the top of your camera. So um, take the GH4, for example, there's a dial on the top, but you can, it's very clever, they brought an update out and you can actually just go into the menu and turn 4K photo on and all the settings are done for you. And then you can start filming. If you can look at the GX8 and the G7, they've got a couple of little other toys amongst them. They can do pre-burst, they can use 4K start stop, which is what I tend to use the most of, where I press the button to start, press the button to stop. Um, again, you turn that function on and the settings are automatically done for you. So it's it's been made to be it's child's play. My nine-year-old daughter uses it, and she understands it. Um, so it's, it's just getting hold of the camera and seeing it in front of you, and then you'll go, "Wow, this is actually really simple," and and something that hasn't been sort of shouted about as much as it should be. I've been shouting about, but I'm only, only sort of one voice. Um, but it's it is very simple to use. Uh, if you go what if you go into GH4, you can go into uh, the camera mode and you can flick all your changes on there, you can do it fully manual or you can just flick 4K photo on and it'll do the uh, stuff for you as well. We just, uh, I was chatting to Sam and Steve who's been filming with Ross today and I, I'm privileged to, to know some of the concepts behind the images but I think both Sam and Steve who obviously are videographers um, and have worked with the likes of other uh, other photographers who've been using sort of triggering systems to capture some of the sort of photographs that you've captured today that we'll be sharing with our members very soon. They they were uh, impressed with 
not only the quality of the image, um, but the, the the speed it was able to take them because you were, obviously you were using the continuous lighting, but you were setting the shot up, hmm. and you could pretty much, like you said, you, I, I don't know how long how, how long you, for example, you, you did some dropping of uh, into into water shots today. How, how how much how long would you film for that? We we dropped uh, some lime into the water today, and uh, I got the giggles at one stage. So I think we spent five minutes, and we did three takes. And I've seen the I've seen the cells on the back of the camera, and again, guys, we'll be sharing these films with you really, really soon on the Top of Academy. But yeah. you know, those are the sort of shots that you would be taking a lot of time on with triggering systems, using Studio Flash. The but the but the quality was there. Otherwise, you wouldn't do it. And that's that that's what I was so impressed with today. Um, I think we have one of your friends with us because uh, uh, they've mentioned they, they've mentioned you a couple of times. But they liked your your retro ski gear. They liked that in the in the shots there. <laughs> Um, but, but he's actually asked, uh, did Jesse Thomas uh, buy your image because he bought mine? So, uh, uh, yes, he did. <laughs> um, okay, so some more techie questions coming through. Um, so you've talked about that you use continuous LED lighting uh, when you're shooting in the studio. Uh, you mentioned earlier, obviously, that lighting can cause a flicker. This is common anyway with video production but they don't have to use continuous lighting but you said something about having to sync your frame rate is that correct yes um, with with tungsten actually probably the worst type of uh, not tungsten fluorescent lighting is is the worst lighting you get the most flicker from um, if you go outside you obviously that big bright thing in the sky is has got no flicker at all um, in fact if you want around at night is quite interesting because the street lights the old street lights do flicker whereas the new ones are actually LED um, LED lights don't tend to have that flicker. And what's happening with the older lights or modeling lights, even on studio lights, there's the set at a frequency. So they are flickering away, but not visible to the human eye. But when you're shooting at a higher shutter speed, the camera will pick that up and it looks like it's banding in the background. Um, in fact, I actually deliberately put a photo up earlier, which included it, which was the photo of Emily Sande. And I'm just going to pop it back up, and you'll see a very slight um, banding in the background because I meant to actually mention it. Um, it's on screen now. Um, yep. And uh, okay, so I'll show you my screen now. Okay, so if you look on the left, sort of left quarter, top left quarter side, you can see some faint sort of lines there. Okay, so that what that is caused by that's banding by the lights or the stage lighting. And what's actually happened, if I dialed my shutter down a little bit more, a little bit slower, that would disappear. And on the, the one of the cameras I've got, which is the GH4, it's got synchro scan, and that allows me to dial my shutter speed down by a third of a shutter speed each time. So rather than going 1 25th to 100, it'll go down to like uh, 20, 18, 16, and even 0.2. So it's very small increments of movement. But it's just matching that frequency of the lighting. And it's very visible, because you can see it on the back of the camera actually changing. We did it today. We actually videoed the change today. Um, and you, you, you see it come around. around. Once you get around 110, 112 mark, you tend to sort of nail it uh, of second. And that shutter speed is, is the key to it. But when you're when you're lighted in the studio and you you do have to sort of put all those elements together of your ISO, your aperture, and, and your shutter speed. So sometimes you're going to have to compromise what you really want to achieve. You may have to, you know, you don't have to sort of nuke the hell out of your lighting to get it lit, to be honest. you just got to be um, wise about it, really. Portraiture, you can easily shoot with modeling lights and shoot 4K. There's no, no sort of, and you've seen ones tonight shooting that. So it, it's pretty straightforward to do on that front. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't, uh, I, I would just, it's just practice. And it's one of those things, getting, getting used to your camera as well and just dialing it down. If you're shooting 4K, you'll notice that flicker and then you'll just, especially in manual mode, that's why I always tend to shoot 4K in manual mode because I've got full control. Um, sometimes when I shoot stills, I don't, I'll, I'll go through the whole lot, but when I'm shooting uh, 4K, I do shoot manual. This is quite an interesting question, Russ, because obviously we talked, and you quite talked in, a, in depth tonight about the, the applications and what you can use the 4K photography for, but somebody specifically asked, and I thought it was a good question to hang on to, um, how could you see yourself using it as a wedding photographer? 
Ah, good question. Um, as a wedding photographer, you've just employed an absolutely free photographer. Another hand, so get your camera, put it up near the altar because it's, there's no shutter going off on a tripod because you can trigger your camera remotely from about 30 meters. So uh, I'm, if you, you can be down at the back of the aisle doing that beautiful long shot down the aisle and you can also have your iPad or your assistant or one of you guys just dropping and looking at your phone uh, and composing, taking that photo or filming in 4K, grabbing that photo later. So yes, that's how you can use in wedding photography. I thought it was an interesting question, and I thought because obviously you know, uh, obviously you've told everybody that you're primarily a portrait and commercial photographer, and obviously I was thinking myself, um, uh, you know, especially us here at the studio being sort of more general practice, and we do a bit of everything, but we do a lot of weddings, um, and I could see there were times in a wedding where you would switch to 4K. I could get that, but I think the majority, uh, you know, you still be shooting uh, traditional values, but you know, you. you how many times have we missed the confetti shot or how many times have you missed the flowers being thrown um, but and actually we hadn't touched on this it was great that you had because I'd forgotten about it and you talking to me at lunchtime today about it the fact that you can remote trigger I thought was brilliant because obviously both have a love of street photography we both do street photography um, and we've talked about I mean there are some fine lines about the discretion and should we be doing and this that, and that I truly believe that I wouldn't photograph anybody that I didn't think would want to be photographed and it is generally but um, we've both done it you, you, you've shown me the image today from the from the uh, London Underground which was awesome and it's on your social media so we'll make sure they get to check that out and I took one a couple of years ago on the tube in New York which was exactly the, you know the same premise uh, but I didn't have the luxury of being able to do it quietly, so um, fortunately it was quite lo no noisy and loud on the on the on the tube. But you know, did I get caught? I might have, but he didn't say anything if I did. So um, so I like that. And it, and I, coming on that tomorrow, we're going to do some street stuff tomorrow, so that'd be good. We're going to film that and share that with the guys. Um, you did answer this question already, but we've obviously got a few people who might have come a bit later to the game, so it's good. So um, they've asked specifically, can you frame grab from the camera? So if we can just touch on that again. You can frame grab from the camera. You can uh, frame grab, and you, that what happens when you frame grab in camera, uh, it's, uh, you, you file through because the luxury with the camera, I mean, um, uh, you, you, you can see it playing back in actual 4K. I mean, to put it in context, I've got a 2009 MacBook Pro. So you don't have to worry about running out and buying a new MacBook to, to do 4, 4K because we're doing 4K photos. So in camera, you can um, grab it in camera, choose which one you want, and that will save that JPEG straight after that movie file. So think of your movie file or your MP4, whatever format you decide to shoot in. Think of that as your raw footage so you can always go back to that to grab a fresh JPEG because remember JPEGs do unfortunately compress. Um, so you can always go back into Lightroom or in camera if you want to do it. If you're out, out in the sticks and uh, or you want to get that photo online, you can, you can in camera, transfer it to your phone, bang it up online very quickly. It's really simple to do. So uh, that actually leads us quite nicely into the next question. Um, so on the frame grab on camera is JPEG. When you import the film into Lightroom and you're taking your frame grabs there, is it still grabbing them as JPEG or can you choose what they grab it as? Uh, it's it's is a JPEG, uh, but obviously when you when you say that you can save as different formats, but the natural format it produces is a JPEG, uh, which I'm quite happy using. Uh, that's what I'm printing everything from, um, and that's the key thing as well, which we don't do enough as photographers. We people don't print enough. Um, we've got to get back into it. Prints look so much better than than screens, um, and when you when you print your 4K stuff, I think you actually blow yourself away, to be honest. Um, because the quality is just outstanding. If you think stuff looks good on telly, looks good better better on paper. <laughs> oh, I, I I I totally agree. I think we, you get to, you got to a stage where we definitely did it here, where everything was just you know portfolios were on our iPads and you were just sending. Things. And uh, just out of the blue, I decided to print a, a book from a from a travel trip that I did, and it just prompted me then to go back and. I made four of different journeys in the end because I wanted, you know, I wanted that book format. I think it's more uh, achievable financially now, even if you're just doing it for yourself. 
never mind creating albums for, for, for promo and things. But, um, you know, I'd got used to my portfolio being on my iPad. And I thought, you know what? And it was very interesting that we had, uh, it's funny you should you should say about print, uh, as you well know, she's a friend of yours. We had Vicky Volta online with us last week talking about her digital art because she's a digital artist. But the one thing that she said um, for her, and if she'd tell you tomorrow, if you were starting out, would be have a physically printed portfolio. Yes, a yes. A tangible printed portfolio. And she said that whenever she's gone to her commercial clients and her clients, when the customer comes into the studio or the commercial client can go back, I'm not talking about a massive one by any standard, but still that physical book, she said, even though you think in this day and age it's gone, it hasn't. And it changes the perceptions of the, of the client uh, tenfold. It's, it's like going to show and tell, isn't it, really? It's, you put something in someone's hand and they fall in love with it straight away. But if they look at it on screen, they can't touch it. They can't turn those pages. They don't bond with it. I go back to that word again. Bonding with the camera, you bond with those photos. You understand what they're about. You can actually turn them, live them. But if they're, if they're on a screen, they're, they're just on a screen. And as another string to your bow is a sales tool because that customer, that client, maybe not a commercial client, but still would be because they're talking about billboards or posters or prints for their hotels or whatever it is, but a portrait client physically seeing that, oh, hang on a minute, I can have that of my family on my wall. I can have, you know, yeah, hands down. I mean, it's that's sales and you can join us for that for another session, but absolutely, mate. Um, so looking at sport photography, um, obviously you've touched on that a little bit tonight. Well, I've touched on it quite a bit tonight. So, so for sports photography, um, would you recommend, what would you recommend a shutter speed would you use to grab and still the freeze the action? Well, sports photography, it depends what conditions you're, you're photographing in. If you're photographing in a stadium or something like that, then uh, that's going to vary. Um, it depends what you also want to shoot. If you want to add mood, I've, I've shot, I shoot triathlons as well. Um, and gosh, I normally shoot about probably around a thousandth of a second. Um, and then. It, it depends really when you do it. I've shot a 30th of a second um, at the World Champs, the IT World Champs in London, just to get that drag and actually panned with the cyclist to get that movement. So that all of the background is blurred, but the cyclists uh, are actually sharp. So it depends what you want to shoot. But if you want to get something really uh, pin sharp and freeze, freeze everything as well, you want to be shooting at a high shutter speed. Um, if you want to do big scenics as well, you, you want to sort of go wide as well, maybe crank it up about f11 so you, you get more of that, that scenery in. If you just want to pull out that cyclist or that individual runner, you want to be shooting around f2.8 f as well. So there's lots of elements involved in sports photography. Depends what genre you're shooting as well. Very, very good sports photographer to look at is a guy called Ian Cook. So worth, worth checking him out as well. So to some extent, they're the same principles for photo going back to the principles of photography really adapting those but then shooting in the 4k so you've got well more than you had in the past obviously so but but where you I think a good example of where you said that you're still working as a photographer you know it's, it's quite easy to get hung up on this video element yes you're shooting video but using the principles of photography so you use the same sport photography principles depending on what you want to capture but obviously you're shooting for maybe a couple of seconds or even longer, um, depending on what you're what trying to capture, but uh, brilliant. Um, so this was another question coming in through now because we've talked about video and file sizes. So now with 4K photography, is hard drive space the issue? No, because the way I shoot it, I only, I only shoot uh, in, in small bursts because I'm not a videographer who's shooting massive uh, weddings or anything like that. Um, I, hard drives are also developing as well. You're getting more and more space as well on, on small drives. But I'm shooting 15, 20 second slots like the, the water fight which you would have seen earlier um, of the kids throwing water. That was from a 25 second clip and that for that 4K photo sequence through that. And that's, that's quite small. On, on my uh, on my hard drive. So no, for me as a photographer, because I'm not I'm not a videographer. I'm only using small amounts. I've yet to actually go out for a day and fill up a card when I'm shooting 4K photography. So I'm using between I mean using a 16 gig or a, or a, um, a 64 gig card, and I'm yet to fill a card up. Um, if you can be be quite savvy with it as well when you're shooting 
and you think, right, I haven't got that shot. Have, if you scan through a new camera and you're not happy with it, don't delete it till you get home as either because you may actually find footage. And I learned this from Mark Clearcon actually a few years ago. You know, always keep your raw footage. Don't delete them even when you're sifting through because there may be a file in there which is valuable to your customer but has no emotional value to you. So do keep them. So in a workflow sort of process then with the 4K photography, are you sort of backing up your clips to, you know, to a drive or whatever it is and then are you saving, say, your desired frame grabs somewhere else and are they sort of what your go-to is and are you keeping all of your clips or are you actually binning them down the line once you've got your frame grabs? Um, I keep my clips because those are my raw footage. Um, my my workflow is pretty simple. I get home, um, I open two windows, I drag and drop from my card into that client's file. So portrait, Mrs. Jones, drag that into there. So Mrs. Jones will might have a shoot history. She's done stuff before, so she's got her own folder. That goes into there. Then I'll go to Lightroom and import from there. Now, I know other people copy from Lightroom, but this is just the way I work. I add to the catalog when I go into Lightroom, and then I'll look at stuff. So I would have actually done some uh, frame grabs in the back of the camera, so those will pop up as well. One thing that's important when you go into Lightroom as well, if you're grabbing photos in Lightroom, sometimes they will stack behind the original footage. And you'll be looking at it going, where is it, where is it? All you need to do is click on your file folder on the left-hand side and, and they'll unstack beside that. So if that happens, that's what you do. But then I, then I go to them and I do, I do keep them. My, my, uh, my workflow is very simple. That's all backed up. I uh, back up everything as well at the same time. So and that gets tucked away somewhere nice. Digital does scare me a little bit when we've got boxes and boxes of negatives, which I know is sound and safe. And you just wonder how long is this digital format going to last? Is it going to deteriorate? That's another talk altogether. Uh, well, that's the cloud, isn't it? I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, it, actually, quite interesting. I mean, a, a, a subtle plug, I guess, for one of our sponsors. But the file sizes in the, uh, that you're talking about, I mean, we use SmugMug. I don't know about yourself, Ross. But if you've got a SmugMug Pro account, their cloud service, you know, is unlimited in their video files as long as they're under a certain size, which they will be. So technically, that's part could be part of your workflow. So yes, we've got backup drives here, but we store what we can to the cloud. So just being careful, isn't it? And obviously, just like anything, work the best workflow for yourself. Really. Uh, this was quite an interesting question. I don't know if you well, you'll know the answer. I'm sure. Um, of, can you fit an external monitor so you've got a bigger screen to view? Ross, not a I, 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 yes, you can. You can have a lot of fun with the external monitors. If you're looking at Atomos uh, show guns, you can shoot externally. Um, now, now, I'm not a videographer, so my knowledge is on, as a videographer is, I would call slim. But um, you know, you can shoot a show gun, and the quality at 4K is immense um, because you're shooting to that particular device. You can, but you can just shoot to a normal. So if you want to shoot to an HD monitor, you can do that as well. I, I've actually done that uh, trial by now, and it's quite cool. So if you're using a rig or something like that, it can be put into play for that. Um, uh, it's everyone. Everyone works different. You have 20 photographers beside each other. They'll shoot 4K differently. Um, no one will shoot the same. Uh, it was interesting that we touched on it because I haven't seen it in play yet. I'm going to see it in play, I think, with you tomorrow. But you talked about the remote shooting, and obviously I presume that you were talking from an iPad. Or uh, Is there a live view f uh, format on that then? Is that a live view? If you've, yes. So, so effectively, if you've got an iPad, you have got your larger monitor. And obviously, if you've got a HD iPad, you're seeing it a pretty hefty revenue. So the cheaper option, because most of us have got tablets today, haven't they? Um, well, rather than the Shoguns and the Atmos is that we're talking about a lot of money. But, I mean, Sam's got a Ronin and it's amazing, but it scares the hell out of me as well. Um, this was quite a nice question, Ross. We're getting to the last last couple now. Um, so we've talked about, obviously, capturing motion, uh, but in 4K, can you actually create a slow, show splatter, uh, show st slower shutter speeds so you could create motion blur? I have tried it, but... Uh, because you're shooting at 30 frames a second, it doesn't. You will get some blur if if you shut it down. It's a, again, it's the same principles as photography. Uh, you will you will get those motions, but um, it doesn't tend to have the same effect as on if you're shooting stills. I find if you want to really stop, 
stop down and, and get that shutter speed down to, I don't know, where you, if you want to shoot half a second, fifteenth of a second, don't know how steady your hand is, or if you're shooting on a tripod or whatever, or whatever you look for, you can you can go slower, but you know, you've got full control on that camera, and you've created, you, your, your imagination is your limit, really, on what you want to do, so you, you can, you can do it. Uh, this was quite nice. Actually, no, I'm going to finish with this one in a second. We'll finish with this one. So let's get the last couple of questions out of the, out of the way. Um, so you talked about, um, oh, sorry, no, you didn't. Talk, uh, you, are you restricted to 15 to 20 second burst? What's the maximum burst duration or the minute or the lowest burst rate? Okay, with a GH4 or a GX8 or a G7, you're restricted to 29 minutes and 59 seconds. And that's because if you go any higher, they'll be classed as uh, camcorders. However, there is a GH4R, which has got unlimited recording on it. And if you, so, if you're doing events with recording speeches and stuff, you need to record an hour or something like that. You want to be uh, recording, uh, for, like on a GH4R, which is unlimited recording. But you can record for 29.59, press stop and start again, and then you've got another 29.59 seconds. Uh, brilliant. Um, do you use a specific color space when you shoot? Uh, no. <laughs> I tend to go what, what, what I like at the time. Preferences, Cine D or Vlog is, is sort of my ones I tend to like, but then I play around with the others as well. Uh, Vlog, if I want to get a gritty look, Cine D if I want a vibrant look, um, but um, otherwise, it depends Depends what sort of feel I want to actually add to it as well. If I, if I want to uh, tweak it a lot in uh, Lightroom and I want, I'll exploit that dynamic range which I've got now with Vlog, I'll, I'll shoot on that, and that's, that's quite amazing. The, the difference you can you can pull out of that absolutely blew me away, um, but yeah, it's it's just what looks good on the back of the camera. I'll look at it and go, yeah, that looks great. I'm going to shoot in that. Brilliant. Um, this well, I think this is quite key actually to obviously the beginning of our, our your talk this evening. So maybe uh, they maybe they've missed this because obviously we've talked about the fact that you use Panasonic cameras designed for 4K photography and they were doing the frame grabs. So this was came in through a gentleman saying that, well, I have a GoPro and obviously that shoots 4K video. Um, so obviously I understand that I'm going to be doing more of a screen grab than a frame grab. Uh, no, no. Screen grab is on your screen. He can do, a, he should be able to do a frame grab using Lightroom. So, so he can GoPro still, he can works still... in a similar process? I would imagine. I would imagine. I'd imagine so. It's an MP4 file. Um, uh, I can hear um, it's an MP4 file, so he he should be able to import that into Lightroom, and um, have no problem with that whatsoever. Um, well, the second part of his question then was, if he does this, you know, what kind of file sizes could he print? Well, it's the same basis that we've talked about tonight with the Photoshop and things like that. And again, it depends, I suppose, on the settings of your GoPro in the first place, isn't it? It does depend on the settings of the GoPro. Um, it depends on the sensor as well on the GoPro. Um, so it, even though it's 4K, you, you make sure you should. You should to be fair. You should be able to get an 8.3 meg file out of that. Um, I personally haven't tested the GoPro. I've just got the older two um, ones before 4K came out on them. Um, but I haven't tested on a GoPro. But the principles. In theory, should be able to do it. But yeah, by all means, drop me a line. I'd love to hear how he gets on, actually. Well, I, 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 I haven't done it in a while, but I have taken my GoPro, and I, like I said, I've got one of the old ones, and I've taken it to uh, a few uh, concert gigs, and I'd have shot, you know, just put, put it up in the air. But I've, take, I've done it as stills, not video. Um, but being able to print quite comfortably, I think I did a print, which, like you said, A3 or whatever it was, and never thought of taking it bigger but printed it clearly uh, and uh, with no issues on that at all. So, um, so, so that, well, that's good. We've answered those questions. Uh, so yeah, that's, we've just done that one. Um, okay. So, um, well, first of all, let me read you a few of these. Uh, really interested. And I now know, understand what fake it 4k is. So I'm going to be definitely looking into it. So thank you, Russ, for that. Um, uh, we've got quite a few of them coming through, mate, to be honest with you. So I'm not going to go and blow too much smoke up your backside there. Um, but, but definitely enlightened and definitely uh, really interesting for the application. So they're loving the ideas and 
uh, and what you can do it for. This, this I have to share with you. I kept this one for the end. So this is more for you than anything else. Um, I used to be based in Criselli, where you live. Um, I had to leave uh, because I couldn't get enough photography portrait work in my studio, and I now live in Yorkshire, so I'm really impressed that you've done it, and should I move back? Absolutely. Absolutely, too right. There's always enough work for photographers around the place. There's more than enough work to go around. The world's a small place. Got cars and planes and everything these days, even electricity down in Pembrokeshire. <laughs> Excellent. Russ, thank you so much for your time tonight. I mean, you've been with us today and you're with us tomorrow, so uh, really excited. I've seen some of the back of the camera stuff, so I know when we get that video done with the boys, and that's going to be coming real soon. So in the next couple of weeks, we're hoping to have this whole series of 4K photography on the site. So from me to you, thank you. There's loads of thanks coming through on the chat panel. Uh, so I think your work is done. You've deserved uh, for me to take you out and buy your snake now. Uh, so that's what's going to happen. Um, so really, really looking forward to results. And again, just from me to you, thanks for your time tonight. Absolutely. Absolute pleasure. Love to remember it. Thanks, Jack.